Welcome, everyone. Welcome to day two of Autodesk University. We are so excited to have you here. Uh, we do have a great lineup today. Uh, we have a couple of different presenters. Uh, first off, I have Rachel Hartley, who will, is joining us to talk to us a little bit about our group network here at Autodesk. And we have Beth Evanu, who is a customer just like you. And she is here to present um, a couple of different topics that we'll introduce you to when the time is right. Um, but this is our architectural community meetup. We have these on a regular basis every month. We've been having them for the past year. So virtual is nothing new for us, uh, which is exciting. Uh, I would like to know though, while our numbers are still rising, where are you joining us from? So if you could go ahead and open up your Q&A panel and type in there. Actually, I'm gonna ask you for two things today. Since this is day two at, of Autodesk University, first one I want you to answer is, where are you coming from? So type in there where you're coming from and then add to that, what was your favorite session from yesterday? So I see Robert is coming in from o Omaha, uh, Ryland from Chicago, Elizabeth uh, from Massachusetts. And I've got to slow this down. I don't read as fast as it's going. <laughs> you guys are submitting them quickly. Uh, Leo from St. Augustine, Florida, David from Pennsylvania, Molly from Indiana, Bob from New Mexico. Awesome to have all of you here. Uh, Stephen says he's from Pittsburgh and the design slam was his favorite yesterday. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. I'll have to go back and, and watch the design slam. I think I missed that one. I was uh, a little busy getting ready for today. Uh, and then we have Todd. Todd is coming in from uh, Elkhart, Elkhart, Indiana. So, or in, is it Indiana or in Indianapolis? I, I get those mixed up. Uh, Robert uh, said that his favorite was the keynote, AEC keynote. I liked that one too. That was very informative. Uh, Mark from Manchester in the UK. Excellent to have a global audience. Ooh, I have Adam from Salt Lake City, Utah. I'm out of Utah as well. So great. Uh, let's see, who else do we have? We have someone from Montreal in Illinois, um, Green. Greenville, South Carolina, Sacramento, California, Seattle, Houston, Texas. Um, cannot do no microphone. Okay, so that's okay. All right, um, our numbers are still climbing quite rapidly. So I'm gonna give everyone about two more minutes. We had quite a large number of people registered. In fact, yesterday in our civil engineering meetup, we maxed out our maximum number is a thousand one people and we completely maxed out yesterday so uh, hopefully everyone is able to get in that wants to if not we are recording the session so not a problem everyone can watch that later uh, a few more people coming in we've got california uh, bert says that his favorite uh, is the design slam he's coming from california um, Patricia says that, that her favorite was the architect engineering and construction keynote. Excellent. Well, I think while we're letting everyone finish getting their um, audio set up and, and get logged in, I will go ahead and run through a few items of business that we need to cover. So I'm Michelle Rasmussen. I am the AEC content manager here at Autodesk. What does that mean? Well, my job is to make sure you have the learning content you need to learn how to use our software effectively to do your job. We don't, we don't want you spending a lot of time spinning your wheels. We wanna give you those productivity tools to help you do your job efficiently and go home at the end of the day or just spend time with your family at the end of the day, right? Um, you may not be going home, you may not be traveling at all, but we want you to have that time with your family. So that's what we are all about. Um, oops, my slides don't wanna change, there we go, all right. Uh, just quickly, our safe harbor statement, if we by chance make any forward-looking uh, forward statements, I don't want you to make any purchasing decisions based on those statements. Uh, if you are making purchasing decisions, definitely look at the software in its state today and make those decisions based on that alone, okay? And uh, last item of business, your lines are muted just for background noise because we are recording this session. And an email will be sent to everyone who registered at the end of this uh, so that you can watch the recording, you can share the recording, uh, whatever you wanna do there. Um, but 
our background, we want to reduce how much background noise we have for that recording so your lines are muted. However, I highly encourage asking questions. I can't promise we'll get to all of them. There are going to be a lot more of you than there are of us, uh, and, and we may not get through every single question, but we will do our best. Um, and the way you can ask those questions is, one, you can put them in the Q&A panel, just like you did when you were putting in where you're coming in from, or the other option is to raise your hand in the attendee panel. If you raise your hand in the attendee panel when we come to the question and answer sections, uh, I will be able to unmute your line and you can ask your question live. It's the best way to do it when we're doing these meetups. Um, it's the closest thing we can get to face-to-face -to -face, uh, when, when we can't get face-to-face, -face, right? So, so that's what our options are today. And uh, with that, I am going to turn the time over to Rachel Hartley. She is our community program manager for the Autodesk Group Network, and she's going to tell you all about that. So, Rachel, let me go ahead and give you presenter rights. Awesome. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Great to be here with you today. Happy day two of AU. Um, I'm really excited. I know um, I have a busy schedule today, so excited that my calendar is filled up and there's so many amazing sessions to have. So thank you for having the time to you know, step into this one. Uh, excited to be presenting. So uh, for those of you that do not know me, my name is Rachel Hartley and I'm the program manager for the new Autodesk Group Network. So the Autodesk Group Network was formed in 2019 to support our um, global network of user groups. So if you're not familiar with it today, um, now hopefully after this you will be. So um, I want to start with launching a poll just to get a good gauge of, um, you know, if you're interested in finding other meetups and user groups to participate in. I know probably for some of you, you've been coming to this architecture meetup for a quite some time now, but let's see if you're interested in finding other communities to participate in. So Michelle's launching a poll for us. And if you could just uh, start to answer that quickly, we'll see, see the numbers rise and find out what the results are. I see 48% have voted. Uh, definitely get your vote in. I'll be closing the poll right after 60 seconds. So I love it. Everyone is voting pretty quickly. Uh, we're at 64% already. So if you haven't voted, get your vote in now on if you'd like to be joining other community groups. 74%, now it's 75. All right, I'll give you 30 more seconds to get your vote in. I see a lot I of yeses. Numbers. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, sorry. I was just saying, I'm seeing a lot of yeses come in, which is really great. And, you know, some not sure, but hopefully we'll have some excitement afterwards. That's right. All right, I'm going to give you five more seconds. We have 83 people who have voted. Five, four, three, two and one. All right, I'm closing the poll and we can take a look at those results. 68% uh, say yes, you're definitely interested and only 4% say no. So that's okay. Uh, I know everyone learns in different ways and has different um, priorities and so excellent. Awesome. So it's really great. Thank you guys for taking that poll. Um, you know, just to help uh, set that frame and because um, a large percentage of you are really interested in finding these new community meetups and groups you can become a part of um, this is our sole mission with the Autodesk group network and why we formed this user group program and it's our global network of user groups developer groups and online groups that you can join to connect with others to learn and build relationships and share knowledge so you'll see in the network um, now we have over 170 plus user groups that are both physical and online groups. The online groups can span from Facebook groups, LinkedIn, if you're in Russia by chance, uh, VK and Telegram is very popular, WhatsApp groups. So these are all in, um, user communities that you can get involved in. Most are led by our customers, so we have really amazing, passionate group leaders who are our customers or just users like yourself. And we also have channel partners and even Autodesk employees leading groups like Michelle here and this architecture meetup. It is listed in a part of the group network program. So if you want to find more groups in the network, I'm posting in the chat for you just to go directly to our site so that you can start searching and filtering by product or industry to find groups relevant to you. Um, but I do want to spend some time just giving a frame on why we created the group network and what our mission is and who we're trying to serve. So when we founded the Autodesk Group Network, 
for really rooting deep into this vision where people connect in community to share knowledge and collaborate across firms and industries to improve the use of design technology and ultimately make a better world. And for most of our customer led groups and any of our groups in the network, you know, I think this really aligns with their vision and why they decide to create user groups to share this knowledge to connect with new users and people and ultimately that's going to improve how they use Autodesk technology. And so, you know, why the Autodesk group network though? We have all of these individual groups leading and aligning with this vision. Um, this is what they're seeking to do. But in forming the group network, we wanted to understand as Autodesk, how can we underpin this community with the right tools and resources that are really going to be valuable to these user groups. And ultimately it's for us to manage, help um, these user group leaders manage their user groups better and easier and more efficiently so that they can spend more time focusing on value add activities like gaining speakers, um, hosting their events, managing virtual events now, and ultimately that's to grow their community and to reach new users and customers and expand their network. Um, another really important part of why we formed the Autodesk Group Network was connecting and collaborating with other leaders. So realizing that full potential of um, being connected in a network so that a um, you know, Dynamo group in San Francisco can connect with a Dynamo group on the East Coast and one in the UK and one in Asia. And so how can being connected in a network be able to start forming those relationships? And this also, um, you know, a lot of customers lead groups because they're reaching their own personal and professional goals. We've had many group leaders who have received promotions from their engagements in user group, the knowledge that they've gained, their expertise, some and a lot. We do have our expert elite members. So we help you try to strive and reach those goals. And ultimately, this comes back full circle into adopting new and better ways of working, um, gaining that knowledge, using the technology better and uh, really uh, improving that use of design technology. So it's really important for us in the group network and what we um, hone into at the root of everything is that Autodesk is supporting without centrally controlling or owning the user groups in the network. And it's really our focus to be that connector, be that bridge builder um, between groups, between your user communities and users and with Autodesk. So, uh, with that, I do want to just move us into our second poll and last poll of the day, I promise, um, to just understand if you've ever thought about leading your own meetup or online group community. And maybe if you haven't uh, before, but now you're interested in it now, uh, we have that as well. So Michelle will be launching a poll for us. So that poll should be live. I do see 32% have voted. Uh, so get your vote in now. Uh, we'll, I'll be closing the poll in about 50 more seconds. I see about 55% who have voted, so great. And it's okay if you don't want to lead your group. Um, one thing I, I do like to reiterate, you know, as, as far as learning goes, when you are just attending a meeting or a training and you're just absorbing, you know, through watching and listening, uh, that retention is very low. And so it's in the 20 to 30% uh, rate. And, but if you add to that a little bit of an exercise, uh, it increases up to 60 to 75% retention. However, when you actually turn around and teach someone else knowledge that you have, that retention increases to 90%. So it's something to consider to definitely be part of uh, you know, leading a group because it will help you uh, increase your retention of, of how to do things and help others at the same time. So I'm going to go ahead and close the poll now. Uh, we're at 81% who have voted and I'll share the results. So it looks like, you know, overwhelmingly uh, not as many are interested in leading, but 14% is still quite a lot. And I'll make sure that Rachel gets your email address after this um, so that she can follow up for those that said, yes, you are interested in leading a, your own meetup. So excellent. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, it's really great to see um, just that gauge. And, you know, like Michelle said, uh, leading a group is um, definitely not something that everyone considers, um, just like any career path or position that you're taking. Uh, leading a group definitely um, is a little bit more of a full time role sometimes, but um, those that are leading or participating, you know, you can engage in multiple capacities in multiple ways. 
So that's what I think is really great about the Autodesk group network as well, is that you can become a part of this network in multiple capacities. You can, you know, if you are leading a group already and I just have not yet met with you or don't know about your group, please add your group to the network. We'd love for you to join and become a part of the Autodesk group network. Um, but you can find ways to join a virtual group or find a local group near you so that um, even if we're not meeting in uh, physical local spaces, you can at least meet online with that local community. And then for those of you um, that did say you have thought about leading a group or you are interested now, um, becoming a leader and starting your own group is definitely in the realm of possibilities. And we have um, guides and tools and resources to help get you started thinking about how to do that. Um, so I'm going to put into the chat again for you, I'm um, visiting our community dojo, which is an immersive learning website that has knowledge, um, best practice knowledge guides for how to get started uh, creating and leading a user group over time. And those of you that are interested, um, you know, I'm more than happy to set up one-on-one -on -one conversations to talk with it, talk with you through how to get started doing this. So please email us at groupnetwork at autodesk.com and um, I'll be on the other side waiting to help. So that's it for today. Uh, thank you guys for um, being here, taking your time. Enjoy the rest of AU and I hope to see you um, potentially online the rest of the week. Thanks. Thank you so much, Rachel, for that great presentation on group networks. I highly encourage everyone to, to get involved somehow. It's in this time of isolation, I think it just really helps to get that network in there and uh, come together as a community. So excellent. Okay, so thank you again, Rachel, and we will see you on the other side. Uh, for everyone that was interested, again, I will send uh, Rachel your email address and make sure that she is able to get back with you. It may not be this week because I know she's going to be very, very busy this week with a lot of different appointments uh, for AU, but be looking for that maybe next week or the week after um, because there are a lot that were interested from yesterday's civil engineering meetup and uh, a, a few from today as well. So. All right, with that, I have some unfortunate news. We were going to have a presentation on thinking like Revit. Unfortunately, it seems my presenter for that has not shown up yet. Um, I'm not sure what's happened. He, I know he was sick last week. Hopefully, hopefully it's not too serious and that he is feeling better. So, um, so with that, I'm gonna jump this one and we're going to now talk about setting up company Revit family templates, the how and the why behind this. And so let me just quickly back up. For those of you that is, this is your first time joining our architectural meetup, uh, back in, um, I think it was April, May timeframe, I had everyone submit topics on what they would like to see presented. And then everyone voted on those in July. And so these are the three topics that you voted as the, the most um, prominent topics in your mind that you would like to learn about. And so I actually have with me today, Beth Avenue, who is going to be talking to us about those Revit templates. And uh, Beth is an Autodesk certified professional and the BIM manager for OHM Advisors, uh, which is an interdisciplinary uh, firm of over five, 500 people. So she is phenomenal. I think you will really like her presentation. I think you'll gain a lot from it. So with that, uh, Beth, I'm going to go ahead and make you presenter. And I'll let you know when I can see your screen. Okay, perfect. I see your slides now. Beth, the time is yours. Hi, everyone. I'm going to go over how and why to create family Revit templates. So first, we're going to focus on the why. There are over 108 family templates that come out of the box. And unless you're supporting all disciplines, you probably don't need all of these. Also, there are a lot of extraneous styles within those families out of the box, and they might not match your standards, and they also bloat the file size a little bit. But for your own company family templates, you can add your standard units if you want it to be different than what the out of the box is. You can insert your standard object styles, shared parameters that you use across your families, and any identity data that you want to standardize, as well as reference planes. If you've been making any families for any amount of time, you'll know that you probably are going to need more than the two that come out of the box. 
So what's the benefit of all this? It's going to be consistency across your library and across your offices, depending on how many people you have creating content. Also, it's going to save you time every time you go to make a new family. And it's going to create a more uniform library. And hopefully, over the course of making families with these templates, you're going to have a more schedulable library. So how do you go about doing this? Uh, personally, I like to start with a checklist. So what are you changing? What are you deleting? What are you adding? This will change over time more than likely, but just get down in writing what you're thinking. And then start with the out of the box family templates. You're going to create a new folder to get all of your versions into. And these are gonna start out as RFT files, which is the template uh, designation and become RFA files. And later on, I'm gonna show you how to turn them back into template files. I suggest starting with generic families because these can be changed into, it's, it's gonna become your prototype for just about every other family type. Generic models can be changed into most of the other family categories. And there are some though that you're gonna to wanna to start with the out of the box templates, uh, which have unique functionality, things like casework, columns, uh, things that have two levels to them, any of those you're gonna to wanna to start with the out of the box template first. And once you've created all of those families that you want to have in your library, you are gonna copy those to another folder. Now you can change the file extension to .rft. You can do this manually, but I like to use a file rename utility. It just makes it a lot quicker. And something to note though, is that once you change these from an RFA to an RFT, you can no longer edit them. And that's why you wanna keep those original families in a folder with your templates so that you can go back and make updates. It's not really a, if you need to make updates, it's gonna be when. And then the last step for this is going to be repathing your default path for family file templates uh, or for family template files. Uh, anytime you go to create a new family, if you just hit new family, uh, it will start from this folder. So if you change that path, to this path that you've saved your families into, uh, it'll automatically go there. And you wanna do this for anyone that's gonna be creating content across your organization. You might wanna do it for everybody just in case, um, but, which is what I do. And some, some specific ideas for uh, templates that you might wanna build are various detail items, things like line-based detail items where you've added in angled ends or uh, certain elements that are you're going to want to quickly create across your library. Also door panels and frames and hardware where you might be creating multiples of these over the course of years as you come across new things that you need. And then just a kind of a last tip is for title blocks, if you start from a generic annotation, you can switch it to a title block category and still have your reference planes and you can make it a, into much easier, a parametric family that you can have different sizes for. And I'd like to thank uh, Brian Mackey for the inspiration for this presentation. He does a great job of going through how to do this kind of on a um, basic level just for uh, detail items. And he's inspired me to do my entire own library of family templates. And any questions? All right, great job. Um, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna have a five minute Q&A and I see Matt S has his hand raised. And so um, let me get to your hand there, Matt, and unmute you. So Matt, I have unmuted you and it looks like you're self muted. So can you unmute yourself? Oh, looks like you've disappeared from my list. Okay. Okay, so I guess he doesn't want to, to speak after all. Okay, no problem. So we have some questions in the Q&A panel. Uh, one is, are the, the slides available for download? I, uh, if, if Beth is okay with it, I can make those slides available. So Beth, do you, do you give me permission to share your slides with everyone? Yes, of course. 
Okay, awesome. I will I will uh, make sure that we have those somewhere that you can download the PDF of the slides, and uh, you'll receive that link with the recording. All right, uh, Dylan asked the question: Any plugins for content creation recommended? Hmm. Do you use plugins at all, Beth, for your content? I do. Um some i i've just started to use the ctc bim manager and uh, project manager plugins those have been really great um i know that the id8 plugins are awesome i'm, I'm still working on getting those um i'm trying to think and and PyRevit has been also great for as a plugin just in general not just for content creation there's a lot of great tools and that one's free which is which is really nice all right, and, and uh, Dylan did say he uses the CTC skill uh, tools as well, so great. Um, all right, Bruce asked the question, how long did it take you to get your content updated? Um, I'd say it took about a, a week of going through each type that I wanted to create, um, just the templates. There's there's a lot of excess that I put in there, kind of, uh, as far as creating face-based family uh, templates that were for ceiling, wall, and floor instead of doing floor-based, ceiling-based, wall-based. Uh, that's another tip. If you have dealt with Revit for very long, you'll know that anything that's wall-based, ceiling-based, or floor-based as a family will disappear if that wall or floor or ceiling is deleted, but a face-based family will not. It will become unhosted but it won't disappear from the model. Um, so I've kind of purged out any, any wall ceiling or floor-based templates and uh, recreated them as face-based. Great, and Cameron Hughes asked the question, and, and I, I, I was thinking you had this in your presentation, but it might be the next one. Um, can RFT be renamed to RFA temporarily, edited and renamed to RFT? The out of the box ones cannot be. Um, I've had varying success with doing that with the RFTs that I've created. Sometimes I seem to be able to and other times not. So I I would say definitely keep your RFAs in your back pocket just in case. Okay, great. Um, let's see. Christina uh, asked the question, what are your thoughts on shared parameters and default parameters? Any standards and desires that would benefit the AEC community? Ooh, that's a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there are a lot of standards out there, um, but there, there really isn't one in the United States, which makes it a little uh, difficult at times. Um, the, I would definitely use the out of the box default parameters when they when the families have them. So for instance, doors have a, a height and a width that you had um, pretty much have to use. It's a built-in parameter and I wouldn't suggest trying to change that. Uh, that being said, I do have shared parameters for height, width, and length and a, a bunch of other things uh, such as materials and um, things that might be standard across a lot of different um, categories that are built into our company shared parameter file and those what's the benefit of shared parameters is that you can schedule those so once you've added those to multiple families whether they're in one category or, or multiple you can schedule those either together in a multi-category schedule or uh, separate in say a, a door schedule or especially equipment uh, schedule for instance excellent all right, um, I, I love this. Danya is on here. Many of you might know Danya, uh, but she had she says that she had a class at AU 2019 that explores family templates in more detail, and she had really great reviews on it. So thank you, Danya, for sharing that. I she's one of the very seasoned Autodesk University um, teachers here or, or um, presenters, and so I've shared that publicly so that hopefully you guys can can capture that. Um, if not, I'm going to put that link in the chat panel as well and see if you can grab it from there. So thank you very much, Tanya, for sharing that. Um, John Doe, uh, funny, John Doe, uh, says that the CT family tools are great and free. So thank you, John, for sharing that. Um, let's see. Paul, Paul Munn says, what is the best 
way to manage family or different versions of Revit? Any tips on issues? Mm. So there are some um, add-ins to help you with that. I believe um, Unify has a great way of handling it, but again, that's something you would have to buy. Um, personally, I keep a, a library for each year. And then as we go into say, you know, uh, providing content maybe three years back, but not past that point. So you're, um, you wanna make sure that you're not saving things in later versions because you can't open them in the past versions. It, it definitely requires some organization and making sure that you're, you're not overwriting things. Uh, but basically my, my take on it is create a, a library that goes back a while, but you're only providing updates in the current library. So if uh, you're, not, you're not trying to maintain all of those at one time. Excellent. All right, and Stephen Jensen, I see your hand is raised in the attendee panel. I'm gonna unmute your line. Uh, are you able to uh, unmute yourself as well? It says you're self-muted. Oh, and his name moved on me. So it looks like he, maybe he wasn't intending to ask a question. That's okay. If you are brave enough to ask questions live, I would love to unmute your line. Just raise your hand in the attendee panel and uh, I will unmute you. Otherwise, we'll keep going through the, the Q&A in the, the Q&A panel. So Jonathan asked the question, do you find a need to update family templates or start new with subsequent Revit releases? How do you manage that process? Uh, I actually go through and, and compare uh, before I upgrade to a new version. So for 2021, when I go to do that, I'll look at what I have in, in 2020 and then see, you know, sometimes they create new family types um, or they update the, the current uh, out of the box templates. So I'll go through and compare the old to the new. And then if there's nothing significant, I'll just upgrade what I have. But if there's new functionality or, or new content that I didn't have previously, I'll rework those families. Okay, great. And Bill asks a question, do you make these families available for your firm, just you or Revit leaders, et cetera, or anyone, or are they available to anyone in your firm? Uh, our templates are on our network, so they are available. Uh, people can't edit them, but they can access them and create new new families off of those. Um, if people are going to be creating new content, even if they're not technically authorized, so to speak, to do so, I'd rather them start with something that's a lot closer to our template than um, just out of the box or something they found online. Okay, great. I know we said we'd only do five minutes since we were missing one presentation. Are you okay to keep going with a few more questions on this topic? Sure. Okay, great. Um, so Sabrina asks, how can I make text-based family that will adjust to the floor plan scale work I'm working on? Uh, we have special icons that are not in any templates. Do you have any tips for Sabrina on that? Mm, so... If I understand it correctly, I think what you want to do is create a generic annotation family um, that will automatically scale based on the scale of the drawing. So you can put in, uh, for instance, a, a 332nd inch or whatever the standard scale of text into that family and give it a, a label parameter, so uh, or a, a text parameter that you name label or, or text or whatever. And then you can pull that into any, any plan, any view and it will scale depending on what the scale of the drawing is and still be legible. Okay, great. And I love the comment that Danya makes here. Um, she says, lock down the shared parameters so that only the BIM manager family builder can edit them and set up cu company custom parameters in there. So that's a really great tip. I, I'm sure that's probably what you're doing, Beth, when you say that no one else can edit them except for, for those in charge, right? Right, yeah, we actually have a, a BIM manager folder in the network that only I and maybe a couple other people have access to or have right access to, um, W-R-I-T-E, not <laughs> R-I-T-H-T, um, so that only um, a few people can actually change those. Excellent, excellent. Well, for time's sake, let's go 
ahead and move on to your next presentation. Um, so Beth actually submitted a few different topics and when everyone voted, uh, two of hers got selected. So uh, I'm gonna turn it back over to Beth and the okay. time is yours. Cool. So uh, this topic is actually using a key schedule as a code tool, uh, finding your occupant loads based on your rooms or areas. So I'm gonna show you how to calculate occupancy with this method but there are many other uses for the same workflow. Uh, you can create a heat map of occupant density, uh, function of space dispersion, um, egress or stair widths, calculate your minimum exit count by room, your parking requirements even, or if you wanted to do a preliminary cost estimate, you could give each room type a cost per square foot and do it that way. So I'm gonna show you a four step process. And the first step in that process are key schedules. So you're gonna create a key schedule just like any other schedule, except that you're gonna select the schedule keys radio button when you first create the schedule. And you wanna be careful to name your parameter and schedule to differentiate them from other schedules and parameters because these are gonna act differently and you wanna make sure that people understand when they're accessing them, what they're for. Then you're gonna add in your schedule fields. Uh, the only one you need for this workflow is area per occupant. But if you wanted to add more parameters corresponding to those uh, additional uses I mentioned earlier, you can do that here as well. Then you're gonna have a new schedule that you're going to insert data rows into, which just means it's inputting blank lines. And you'll see that it's automatically uh, numbering these, but you're going to put in your own data after this. So now you gotta create your keys and you have to do this manually, unfortunately, which is where the grunt work comes in. Uh, and so you're gonna put in your code information and this might be uh, from international building code, NFPA, or maybe your local building code, maybe your state or your uh, country has a different code. Whatever it is, this is where you're gonna put in that information. And you can add more to it over time. I chose to put in everything at once. And actually, we are across different jurisdictions. So I have uh, a few different codes that I'm making sure are in there as well. So the next step is a working schedule. And all that means is that there's no filters or hidden parameters for this. And it's not going to occur on your documents. You're just going to use it in the background. So again, make a schedule, but this time do schedule building components and make sure to include the key and all the associated parameters that you just created in that key schedule. And now you get to create formulas, which is where all the magic happens. Uh, the formula for creating the occupant or finding occupants is just going to be your area of the space divided by your code area per occupant. Now, this sounds pretty easy, uh, but there might be more complex situations such as fixed seating. And if you look in the code, for instance, fixed seating, you're not going to have a square foot uh, allowance. You're not going to get anything if you create this uh, formula and try to put in fixed seating. So the solution is to in introduce a new parameter, uh, code occupant override, and create a, a slightly more complex formula. So you're, if you have area per occupant equals zero, then use the occupant override. Otherwise, use the original formula. And this will give you the uh, seats equal people or people equal people. However many you put in is what you get out. Next, we're gonna look at uh, the actual put, applying those keys to your rooms or areas. You can do this in your properties palette or you can do it within your working schedule or any room schedule that you have this parameter in. And you can see that as everything, uh, as you pick a key, it will automatically infill the other information that is associated with that key and automatically give you occupants for those areas. So to create your occupancy schedule, that's going to be on your documents. All you have to do now is duplicate that original working schedule, which is gonna have all your formulas and all your parameters in it, and just alter it as you need to to, to match your document standards. So whatever uh, 
formatting you need, whatever you need to hide to not see on the drawings, on your drawings, uh, this is where you would do that. And then place it on your sheet. I want to get into a little bit of a discussion on grounding. Um, so why it matters is that depending on your company or your local jurisdiction, they might have different interpretations of how this works. And you obviously can't have portions of a person in a building, but does that mean that every space gets rounded up? Does it mean that the total gets rounded up? Uh, it's a little bit up to interpretation and it's gonna affect your uh, plumbing counts, your egress widths. So it's kind of an important topic. So how do you round in schedules? There's two ways to do this. One is field formatting. In the schedule uh, properties and formatting, you can pick any of your parameters and change the field format, which will take it away from whatever the standard for the file is. Uh, you can set it to uh, zero decimal places, one up to however many you want. As you see, as you get further and further into decimals, you're gonna get a more and more accurate answer, but it's gonna look more funny, so to speak as you get into it, uh, as you increase those decimal places. Uh, the other way is to round by formula. So you can use just round, which will take it up or down based on closeness to uh, the number. So 0.5 goes up, 0.4 goes down. Or you can do round up if you think you need to round up every single uh, space. And that will give you whatever that next level up would be. If it's 3.1, you'll get four. But you can see the difference between these two is actually 20 people, which doesn't seem quite right. Um, so you, you really have to consider how this all is going to work for your project, for your firm, what your interpretation is of the code, um, and what your local jurisdiction's interpretation is. So your field format um, will give you pretty close to what you want if you go into decimal places. And formula uh, can, depending on which way you want to go, uh, give you an accurate depiction as well. So it, it really just depends on how you interpret things. And then one last point is just, what do you use, rooms or areas? This works for either, um, this whole workflow. It doesn't really matter. You just have to make sure to set it up for one or the other. Uh, you can't apply the keys for areas to rooms or vice versa. Uh, really, all it comes down to is, are you including the wall thickness or not within your building? And there are pluses and minuses to each method, and I've done it both ways, and it's, it works both ways. So uh, just something to keep in mind and remember when you're setting this up and decide at the beginning which way you want to do it. And that is all. Excellent, excellent job. Awesome. So uh, again, if you'd like to ask questions, you can throw them in the Q&A panel or you can raise your hand. And Jonathan Bach, I see that your hand is raised. I'm going to unmute your line. Can you speak with us? Uh, yes, I just, can you hear me? Yes, we can yes. hear you. Perfect. I just wanted to mention we've, we've implemented a similar system and we've actually um, tried using both rooms and areas at the same time, but where we've landed is not finding a good method to schedule both together, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, have you found any good way to uh, create like a third schedule that will actually tie those two schedules together, or is that really more of a dynamo operation that we have to, to look at implementing? Yeah, that unfortunately there isn't something native to Revit that will, will bring the two together. There are um, add-ins that will force parameter values from one uh, from one parameter to another that you can use or, or use Dynamo, uh, Dynamo like you were saying. Um, personally, I like to use areas for the gross schedules um, or the gross areas, and then rooms for for the more um, granular. But depending on, like I said, the the local jurisdiction's interpretation of how you can do that it might force you one way or the other. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, uh, Jonathan, for having the courage to, to stand up and, and speak out loud, so that's awesome. Um, all right, so let's go over to the Q&A panel then. Uh, we have quite a few people asking for the slides again. Yes, they will be available, absolutely. Um, since Beth has given me permission to post those, we will post those and send that with the recording link in the email. So. Um, 
uh, Natalia says, this is really great. I would definitely like a copy of part of the, this part of the presentation. So again, about the slides. And oh, see, Ginny is asking, how, how do you differentiate net and gross numbers? I actually have, uh, let's see if I have it shown in here. Uh, do, 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 go back, back, back. To remember, okay, so I have a parameter that is either, it's a, just a text parameter and it's gross or net so that um, users will see it and know which it is, but it's not going to automatically do anything. So it's more of an informative parameter for the users. Um, but there's, as far as I can tell so far, there's no way to automatically embed what it will pull that information from. You kind of have to manage that manually. Okay, great. Uh, Monica asked the question, do you use schedules for takeoff or do you use something like assemble? Uh, currently we don't use assemble. Uh, we've, we've done takeoffs with schedules, but it, uh, we haven't delved too deeply into, uh, into estimating with, with Revit. Great. Uh, Megan is asking, can areas be used in design options? They cannot, if I remember correctly. And go to that last slide. Um, yep, that last one there. Uh, cannot be Areas cannot be used in design options. That's one of the negatives for using areas. Uh, and, and rooms can be, it's something that, too that you could, if you're just doing preliminary design, use rooms to begin with, and then uh, switch over to using areas when you get into the more uh, specifics of maybe DD or CD level. At, at one point, and I've, I've changed this recently, but at one point I had both areas and rooms set up with this workflow so that there's a key schedule for each. Okay, great. And Sam, I'm going to go ahead and unmute your line. I see that you have your hand raised. So can you unmute yourself? I see you unmuted, but I'm not hearing you yet. Do you have a double mute um, on your microphone? Hello. Hi. Yes, we can hear you now, Sam. Oh, perfect. Um, I was wondering if in your schedules you use uh, inbuilt parameters or if you use shared parameters. They are all project parameters except for I think one or two. Uh, there are a couple shared parameters that I can. Well, actually, let me let me revise that. Everything that's in the sh in the key schedule is a shared or is a project parameter, and this is one of the the downsides of. Uh, key schedules at the moment is you can't use shared parameters in there, which is um, there's actually an, uh, a Revit ideas, uh, a Revit idea um, on the Revit ideas website that you can go and, and vote for, for that to be changed so that you can use shared parameters. Um, the the downside of that where that matters is that you can't then use that occupancy in a tag because you need a shared parameter to make the tag. My workaround for that right now is. Um, using one of those uh, add-ins to push the occupancy uh, parameter output that is the project parameter into a shared parameter that is tied to the tag that I use. Um, gotcha. So, yeah. Yeah, we do the same thing. We push it into, we use the tags and then we just check the schedule to see if we got them correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I use, uh, we have the Imagine It Utilities and it has a parameter pusher that um, I just copy, basically I take the uh, occupancy, copy it to a new shared parameter, or an, another parameter that is a shared parameter, which is tied to our, our tags. And that does pretty well, but you have to make sure to update it now and then. Yeah. Okay, great. I'm glad that, I'm glad that uh, we're on the same page because I, I do love those shared parameters to be, to be able to fill them out manually in the plan and then have the schedule auto-populate. For sure, yeah. I, I'm hoping that they get that fixed in, <laughs> in a year or two. Hey, this is Numan. Um, one thing to make sure that uh, uh, the things are correct is I usually do use a, a conditional column. Uh, so if it doesn't match, 
and the overridden value doesn't match the calculated value, then it automatically flags that uh, schedule with a red box or something like that. So that kind of helps error mm. checking. Yeah, definitely. That's a great point. Um, there's Uh, that is how I don't remember if I thought of doing that, but um, that's how I've set up the max occupant load for one door in uh, my schedule as well. So if you have a space that gets over 49 people, you can have it set for conditional formatting to, sh to show up highlighted. So you remember, okay, I need to make sure I have you know, more than one door in this space. Uh, it's been a lifesaver on a couple of our schools where we've got a, a a classroom or two that are just over and we need to either make sure to, to alter the space or add another door. Great. Great. So Naman, I'm so glad that you made it. Um, we're going to go ahead and go back to Naman's presentation. So we'll jump ship here. So thank you, Beth. Amazing, amazing presentations. Great job. Um, so Naman, let me go ahead and make you presenter. And uh, give me one second to get that working. And if you want to go ahead and share your screen uh, while you're setting that up, I will uh, basically introduce you. So uh, Naman is going to talk to us a little bit about thinking like Revit. This was uh, actually the, the very top session that people voted on. So I'm excited that he did make it. So thank you. Um, but he's an expert elite uh, and an architect uh, with and a design technology manager. So he has more than 30 years of experience with Autodesk family of products, including AutoCAD, AutoCAD Architecture, Revit, BIM 360, and Navisworks. So quite a lot of uh, uh, experience there. Uh, Naman, since we are getting low on time, I'll turn the time yep. over to you. Go ahead and start when you're ready. Yeah, okay, I'm ready. Uh, can you guys see my screen? I, I hope. Yes. Um, Okay, hey, thank you so much. I sorry, I, I think my calendar messed up with an hour or so, but I uh, wanted to talk about how to think of with like Rabbit because I've had always have people having a lot of issues in terms of, oh, I am so frustrated, I can't see this object, that object, those type of uh, questions always come up. My, my wall doesn't show up. Uh, but once you start thinking like Revit, how Revit is organized, um, I think it makes it much easier to uh, troubleshoot your problems as well as uh, getting an in-depth idea of what the inner workings are and how Revit basic organization is. The, the bottom most, you know, with the model is work sets. Uh, for work shared uh, models, I'm talking at this point because uh, it makes it easier. There are four types of work sets. Uh, user, families, project standards, and views work set. I didn't, if usually people are going to the work set dialog box and then seeing user created work set, but if you check the other three boxes, you can see the project standards. Those are your settings, those are your uh, materials. All those uh, items are stored under project standards. Your location, families are basically, you know, all the family, inst not instances, but the types. They are a work set on its own. So, uh, and then we all know the user created work set, but the real trick is for user created work sets is that um, they are all these items kind of interconnect together. Uh, they are work together to kind of give you that result at the end of the day to be able to sell your design. Um, these all items basically kind of uh, they connect not linearly but in a loop as that's why the reason i have that but then first you get the levels so the levels is the topmost um, item in terms of a model element uh, what a model element is is all user created items or, or user created work sets contain model items all the model items are hosted typically by the level and then you have hosting elements, uh, basically your wall, curtain walls, floors, roof, uh, ceilings, stairs, and ramps. But they work in tandem with the datums. Uh, level is a datum, but uh, I put it like way at the bottom because it is the uh, 
highest um, prior item, but without a level, there is nothing. Uh, grids and reference planes are also that. And then once you get also, there are links that are also uh, model items. Uh, I put CAD here and you will see CAD show up under annotation objects too. We'll talk about those. Uh, so what are the model elements here? The model elements, uh, we talked about the basic architectural stuff, but we have doors and windows. They are all, always hosted by the wall. Then we have um, architectural elements like columns, text, model text, railings, components like light fixtures, ceiling fan, I mean, uh, specialty equipment, all those fall under the component. Uh, you have rooms, areas that Beth was just talking about, mass elements, site information, uh, structural elements. You have the columns, grid, um, uh, like a beam system, as well as uh, you have the foundations, you got the mechanical system, uh, those are all model elements. They are hosted on a user-created work set. Um, so that's important to understand that because and what all the model element, I describe them as basically anything you can touch and feel in a building, basically, or anything that occupies physical space is a model element, and it goes on the user-created work set. Um, so those are the items here. Uh, now let's talk about the other side of that uh, uh, spin. Uh, oops, sorry. Uh, we talk about, oops, sorry, it went the wrong way. So basically the idea was level is the glue that holds the model together, period. Now let's talk about the views and annotations. Well, we're familiar with the traditional views that we have. We have the architecture a uh, uh, drafting plan or a floor plan. Revit basically knows the industry standards. Uh, you can fine tune them and that's basically, it presents your model in a recognizable format. Basically a view is just a report. You're just looking at a graphical report or a textual report. You combine all those together uh, with detailing elements and everything and uh, create a sheet to present your ideas uh, but all the views hold all the annotation objects so if you have a view work set holds the all the annotations the detail elements as well uh, so the model elements are held by level uh, levels and the user created work sets all the views hold the annotations and cad links if it is specific to that view images and then you take all that compose it into a sheet and present your ideas let's take an example of a building uh, quickly and see that uh, you know i've kind of started blowing it up a little bit and then uh, once i look at sorry it's just uh, you get the level you build up the floor then after that you get you know you can break it up the floor itself into many pieces. So you have so many layers associated with it. So the Revit basically is keeping track of all those items for you and in the view as well. You get the simple wall, you get the main wall, you can explode the wall further into pieces. And then lastly, even the, each family can be nested with you know parts and pieces that you can put together, bring it into the project and schedule each object knows how to represent itself anywhere. Basically in a floor plan, I look like this. In a elevation view, the wall says, oh, I look like that. So basically views become a report. Uh, so that's the dynamic nature. And if you understand the nuances of uh, how things connect, what settings control what, um, and basically part process, and think like Revit, basically you will be able to understand it and get less frustrated once you start the organization in your head and leverage it that way. That's all I had, thank you. Hey, excellent. So I'm gonna open it up again to questions and Robert, I see that your hand is raised, Robert Rodriguez, and I'm gonna see if you're in here twice because it looks like your audio is off air. 
So let me see if you're also available in uh, under a phone line. Let me see. And I'm not seeing you as also available there. Um, so unfortunately, uh, Robert, it looks like I can't unmute you. So go ahead and put your question in the Q&A panel and I'll look for it there. Um, otherwise, let's get jump in. So uh, Bill is asking, could Naman share his PowerPoint presentation? Naman, are you okay if I uh, send a link out to everyone? Uh, yeah, to a fine. PDF of your yeah? yes okay yeah. yes okay excellent excellent well great well unfortunately we are now out of time and I need to go start another session but I want to thank uh, Beth and Nam both you did a fabulous job I um, I really appreciate you being willing to present to everybody all, all your peers. And so uh, I wanna thank everyone else for joining as well. Um, we will make the recording and the slides available after the fact. So you'll be getting an email uh, with those links. And I hope you have a fabulous, fabulous Autodesk University experience. Um, otherwise, we'll see you next month at our uh, next architectural meetup where we will continue the talk around generative design. Thank you, everyone.